Thank you very much for this introduction, and thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how to improve healthcare using AI, uh, more specifically in the field of sleep medicine, which is where I work. This is the nitty-gritty of AI. So there is a lot of hype in AI and machine learning, and there's talk about the in fourth industrial revolution and how robotics will uh, eventually make humans obsolete, and we'll end up with a singularity and all that jazz. But that's not really how we in the field see things. We see uh, two types of AI. We have narrow AI, which is a tool that's made for a specific task. This task could be uh, playing chess, playing Go, driving cars, finding something in images, etc. Uh, general AI is uh, the carpenter, the, the, the creative problem solver. And uh, this is, in my opinion, just sci-fi. We have no idea how to make this. Um, in healthcare, there's a lot of potential for these narrow AIs, though. There's a lot of call for personalized medicine and decision support systems, predictive me medicine and preventative care, and also data-driven research and discovery. So there's a lot that the narrow AI can do, although it's uh, limited. And when we work in the field of healthcare, there, is, uh, there are some constraints that we have to follow. There are some constraints specific to this field. And first, there is... Uh, the principle of bioethics that you want to do no harm to your patient, your, your, your subject. Uh, furthermore, uh, when you create a data product, there's high need for algorithm transparency. This means that the doctor must be able to describe to the patient and explain to him why he made the decision that he made. So, for example, if you make a decision support system, the black box computer says no, paradigm is not acceptable. Furthermore, uh, we sometimes talk about sacrificing the individual on the altar of statistics. And this means that when you train a network, uh, you train a, an algorithm to do some uh, kind of task, you have to uh, optimize for the individual, but not the mean. The algorithm can have a very good mean performance, but uh, forget about the rare conditions and the uh, unknown conditions that they had, haven't previously accounted for. So more challenges uh, in this field is that the technology is usually not the bottleneck. We live in an ecosystem that's highly regulated, and this uh, induces some inertia um, that slows down the adoption of new technologies. For instance, to name a few, we have a regulation framework, uh, complicated incentive structures, so insurance companies, healthcare providers, and also when you introduce a new technology into healthcare, you have to retrain a lot of healthcare personnel. And these are busy people, and retraining all of them is uh, expensive. So a little bit about me. Um, I studied systems and control engineering, and I've been working in the field of uh, sleep medicine for two years, doing mostly data science at uh, Knox Research, Knox Medical. And Knox is in the business of medical device manufacturing. They focus on sleep medicine in particular. And this picture went viral on Reddit in January got 60-something thousand upwards, and this is a woman that's taking her sleep into her own hands. She's reading a book called How to Sleep Well, and it's working. And she's also carrying a case um, with a sleep study system from Knox Medical. <laughs> so sleep is the foundation of good health. Um, and there's been a lot of public awakening about sleep in recent years. People sleep with these daylight lamps, and there's talk about moving the, the clock, and there's a lot of public awakening about the importance. But sleep is complicated. It's not a simple on-off system, uh, and a lot can go wrong. And this brings us to sleep medicine. So there are about 80 clinically defined sleep disorders. Some of the more common are sleep apnea, or kyvesweb. This is the inability to breathe properly during sleep. We have insomnia, it's the inability to fall asleep. And restless leg syndrome, which some of you might have heard of. Uh, that's a neurological disorder that uh, interrupts sleep. As I said, 80 more defined, clinically defined sleep disorders that need uh, detection and a cure. And poor sleep can have severe effects on the well-being of the individual. So how are these disorders detected? They're detected in a sleep study. Uh, a sleep study is typically performed in a laboratory where a patient is hooked up to a variety of sensors that measures biological signals uh, during the night. So, um, as you can see on the boy here, there's no laser pointer. Okay, he's wearing an oximeter on his hand, and this measures his oxygen saturation and pulse. He's also wearing the belts around his chest that measures his respiration, 
uh, an electrode on his chin measures his like lower face uh, muscle tone, and these electrodes on his head that measures the EEG or the the, the brain brain wave activity uh, while sleeping. And sleep is really defined by the EEG. It's defined by the brain. And what we see uh, in a sleep study, and, and and just during sleep when you when you look at the EEG that the brain goes into these periodic pattern, patterns of uh, brain activity. So, I'm sorry about the small font. On the x-axis, we have eight hours of sleep from 11 to 7. And on the y-axis, we have these five discrete sleep stages. You have the awake state, and then you go into N1, which is sleep onset, N2, which is slightly deeper sleep, and N3, which is deep sleep, where a lot of memory consolidation occurs. Then you go back up into N1 and REM sleep. And this is dream sleep, when you have these vivid, crazy dreams. Um, so yeah, uh, humans don't really sleep in five discrete stages, really. But to understand why sleep is classified into these five stages, we have to look back. And uh, 70 years ago, circa, this is how sleep studies look like. You had an analog uh, sensors and amplifiers that wrote down the traces from the signals from the patient on a piece of paper. So these are like earthquake uh, monitors that write down the electrical signals coming from the patient. Then you have poor Steve there on the right, and he needs to go through 30 second pages of these signals and manually label what's happening. And for instance, he will label in which sleep states the individual is uh, currently inhabited. So these make about 1,000 sheets of paper per night that need to be manually reviewed and the events counted in order to make a diagnosis. So 30 odd years later, not much has changed. The picture is in color, but we still have this monolithic analog amplifiers, and we still have Steve there analyzing data manually. Um, in the 2000s, we had the digital revolution, and the sleep study equipment and the instrumentation technology has improved a lot. So this system over there is the Nox A A1, and this is a full PSC system that we can see on the guy on the right, and this is all ran by a single AA battery, so the, 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 the size and scope of this has really been reduced. And Nox also creates these software solutions that allow clinicians to look at the signal traces on the computer screen. So to summarize, the technology of instrumentation has improved a lot, but the data analysis has not really. We still have a clinician looking at sheets of signals and analyzing by eye what's happening. Um, this incredibly rich data, this is about one gigabyte of data per patient per night, is reduced to simple events. So this is like incredible compression. You go from one gigabyte into single bytes. So there's a lot to be harvested from this data. And we want to improve that at Knox Research. We want to move beyond counting events, and we need new methods of crunching the sleep data to get a, like, a deeper insight into the body as a system and the, 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 how sleep disorders are affecting that system. Furthermore, we want to automate and free up humans to do more creative and productive things than simply counting events. So we'll solve it with algorithms. That's what Knox Research is all about. We are an inter interdisciplinary team of scientists with both clinical and engineering backgrounds. We're self-funded through research grants and research product sales, and our mission is like I said, automation, and also discovery in the field of sleep medicine. We collaborate a lot, and our ambitious vision is to connect together the clinical and the technical, be the bridge between these institutions and hospitals that are willing to collaborate with us. So, like I said, two types of project, automation. These are well-defined problems, but not necessarily simple. Uh, I will talk about two of those that we have tackled. That's sleep staging, that's uh, analyzing in which sleep states you you are, and event detection, which I'll go into. And the second part of the talk will be about discovery, discovering new things in the field of sleep medicine. So first, automation. Uh, one sleep staging, this is kind of like how the process looks like. You have these 30 seconds sheets of paper that a human has to analyze and classify into these five discrete stages. And this is a textbook, multi-class, supervised learning problem. So what we did is that we replaced the human for a neural network. And what we do here is that we take these raw signal traces and we convert them into features that 
describe how the signal is behaving. These could be frequency characteristics of the signal or statistical characteristics. These features are then fed into a neural network. And in this case, we used a feedforward neural network. And the neural network outputs the sleep states. So this network performs uh, similarly to a human, but the prediction speed has gone from four hours circa to uh, about one minute or less, depending on the hardware you're running it on. So this frees up a lot of time and frees up the humans to do something more interesting. Uh, Nanna Einarsdóttir talked about this in the Utimessa 2017. So if you want to know more about this project, you can find this on YouTube. Uh, now, what we've been doing more recently is event detection. So from a machine learning standpoint, this is more challenging. Uh, we can see, uh, again, electroencephalogram, the EEG signal there. And there are these events that you can see in the EEG that uh, clinicians use to diagnose people. And finding these events is a very labor-intensive task. Uh, the challenges from a data perspective is that the data set is massively imbalanced. So you have uh, eight hours of sleep, but you might only have a couple of events during the night. Furthermore, the events are vaguely defined, and they vary a lot between patients and within a single patient. So it's very hard to write down deterministic rules that describe these signals. So uh, one event that we tackled was uh, arousal detection. So arousals are these micro-awakenings from sleep. And this means that you're sleeping, and you wake up for a couple of seconds, about 20 seconds there, and you don't remember it. So you might sleep full, full uh, eight hours, but uh, wake up completely exhausted because you had many of these uh, arousals during the night. And this causes what's called sleep fragmentation, and is very important for the analysis of many sleep disorders. So what we did is that we um, applied machine learning to the problem to automate it. So what we do there is that we take this 90-second uh, chunk and we chunk it up into 10 seconds epochs. These epochs are then used to calculate features, and the features are fed into a recurrent neural network that then makes a prediction if the slot, if the 10-second interval, is an arousal period or not. And there are several, this looks straightforward, but there are several challenges that we bumped into. For instance, when a human is labeling events, they don't really care about the accuracy. They only want to count events. They want to know circa in which order events happened and how many of them. So we had a lot of data that was labeled like this. So the neural network predicted the arousal accurately in this case, but the human, our target, is slightly off. So is this approach too positive when we train in the network? So uh, the physio challenge last year uh, is a challenge that um, hosts um, well, it hosts these competitions on uh, doing machine learning on biological data. And we competed with our algorithm against 20 other teams from both, uh, the, both research institutions and the industry. And some of these include uh, Philips and Verilab Sciences. This is a daughter company of Google. And we got second place with our algorithm. We're very, very proud of that. I also published a paper, so if you want to read more about the how, how we did this, uh, it's all in there. And on Wednesday, we got an award for this project. So this is the, the Student Innovation Award uh, given by the president. And it was great to get this recognition and validation on the work we're doing. So there are some pitfalls here that are worth mentioning. So first of all, uh, you have to know your data before doing anything, really. You have to know the processes of uh, how the data was created. Who recorded the data, how did they record it, and why? What was the purpose of the study? Um, you have to know what are characteristics of the cohort that you're using. This means, um, is your data only composed of males or females, children, old people, previously diagnosed people? You have to know what the cohort is. Furthermore, you have to know the physiology. Like, where, uh, what are the mechanical and electrical processes that create the data? This is going to help you sift out the noise from the signal. To know your sensors, which fault states can you expect? This is also important when you need to filter out noise and actual signal. And finally, data processing. Has any cleanup been done on your data before you receive it? 
If so, you should know about it and you should account for it. And also, what's the accuracy and precision of your labels that you're following? A good test for this is uh, to check how well two humans agree. And this is kind of your low bar, like wh where you want to, when you want to go. In the training validation test, we had an interesting problem. So you have these eight hour measurements. And this is basic uh, data science. You want a training set, you want a test set, and you want a validation set. And you want to separate these sets as soon as possible. So you have, like I said, eight hours of sleep. And don't chunk it up, shuffle it, and split it. Because then you will contaminate your training data and your validation data. So you want to split the patients as soon as possible, split the data as soon as possible, and simulate deployment when validating. Plot and visualize the process. It's always good for sanity checking. And find the appropriate cost function. So when we're training machine learning algorithms, we have to know what we're trying to optimize. And you have to account for rare conditions ex uh, explicitly. These algorithms tend to optimize for the mean, but not for the outliers. And again, the labels can be false or inaccurate. Finally, when you deploy, uh, we as engineers and scientists that know the, the, the algorithms, we have to commun communicate to the end users about the extent of which the algorithm can be trusted. What, what are the limits? How has it been tested? Like we, we have to really uh, hide nothing there. Uh, check for data quality. Before you make a prediction, you have to check if the data is good. And if possible, include the confidence in your prediction. Well, this is going to give the clinician or the doctor more um, information on how to base diagnosis. Furthermore, know that the supervised learning methods, they might be untrustworthy when they see something new, something that's not in your cohort, or uh, data from different sensors. So next thing is uh, the discovery phase. So um, in the discovery phase, we want to learn something new. And uh, I work mostly with uh, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a disease uh, that affects about 25% of the general population. And it, um, it's about uh, di breathing difficulties when you sleep. Uh, it's a complicated disease. And the diagnosis of it is boiled down to a single number, the apnea hypoapnea index. This is how many breathing stops you get per hour per night. And because of this simple diagnostics, there is only really one treatment option. And this is the continuous positive airway pressure therapy, which is kind of like a ventilator that helps you sleep during night. And this treatment has uh, very low compliance. So let's look at that. There are these two signals that we want to focus on here. The blue one here, measuring the, the, the ventilation from the nasal cannula, and the green one below it. This is the, the oxygen saturation measured the, at the finger. And we can see here that we have two breathing stops over here. One long one, 90 seconds, that the patient is not breathing during sleep. And a shorter one, that the patient is breathing somewhat, but not really. And this makes two events followed by two oxygen desaturations. So you get a drop in oxygen saturation when you don't breathe, obviously. But a funny thing to see here is that we get another oxygen desaturation, and then it increases again. Like what might be happening there? So what I think happened is that during the long breathing stop, the patient actually started breathing with his mouth. So this is something we have to think about, the fault states of our sensors. Like we have to look at all the signals to make a diagnosis. So we can do better than this. And we're collaborating with these guys at Harvard University on finding different ways to characterize sleep apnea. These guys at Harvard, they are experts on the processes and the measurements, the science of sleep apnea, and the physiology and, and, and pathology of the disease. Uh, we at Knox Research, we are experts on the sensors and the data processing. So this is really a match made in heaven. So on the left there, there's the Knox guys. And on the right, we see Andrew Wellman and Scott Sands. And these hard guys, they have uh, managed to split sleep apnea into four classes. These classes are the low arousal threshold class. This means that you wake up really easily from sleep. Uh, you have the respiratory control system issues. That's wh when your brain is not controlling respiration properly. You have upper airway collapsibility. This is when your soft tissues of the upper airway easily collapse. And decrease upper airway dilator muscle tone. So what we want to do is that we have two patients here. They both have the num same number of breathing stops, but we want to be able to locate them in this grid. And for example, patient one, he only needs treatment for his upper airway collapsibility. And this might decrease his 
AHI. While patient number two, he might have a low arousal threshold and he needs another treatment. So this opens up the possibility for personalized treatment options. Um, the phenotypes of sleep apnea, the phenotype means basically an uh, uh, underlying physiological cause, uh, needs two variables to work, this, this breakdown. And this is ventilation and respiratory effort. Ventilation is measured by the nasal cannula in the nose and the belts that are around the, the, the guy over there. But the respiratory effort is very difficult to obtain. You can measure it by taking this catheter and put it up the nose of the patient, down into the esophagus, and you measure the pressure fluctuations in the airway while he breathes. But this is very invasive and not really scalable. So what we want to do is that we want to infer the respiratory effort somehow from the signals. And the approach we use at Knox Research is uh, this gray box modeling approach. So we use physics and physiology to constrain the solution space of our model. And this is how we can make a lot simpler models that are still, um, that are still very useful. So we see a schematic on the human body on the left. We see a mechanical realization of this model in the center. And we see the guy that's being modeled on the right. So when the belts move, when he breathes, we can map that onto the states of our model. So when we have this model that's uh, trying to mimic the biology, what we can do is that we can feed measured signal into the model, and we can use the model to try to simulate these signals. Uh, the model tries to replicate the signals. And if we do that, we can pretty, be pretty sure about that the model is actually describing the physiology that we're looking at. And the, the fun thing about that is that we can probe the model to get some variables that we don't measure directly. And in this case, that would be the respiratory effort. This is vaguely similar to autoencoders, for those who are familiar with that technology. So the pros of um, gray box modeling is that the model parameters and state, they map onto physiology. This means that the model is transparent and explainable, and the parameters give a clinically important variables and information to, to, that can be used for diagnosis. This includes the airway compliance, the respiratory effort, many more. And also these models, they fit well into Bayesian frameworks. This means that it's uh, quite natural to get a certainty estimation about your prediction. There are some challenges, of course. Uh, challenges of gray box modeling is that it can be difficult to evaluate the performance of your model, especially when you don't have any target data to compare yourself with. And there, visualization is key, but it's hard to scale, of course. And also, data quality becomes very important. What assumptions are you making about your data and your model? Is it linear, unbiased, etc.? And you have to model your noise explicitly. Like, what happens to your model if the patient moves, if he it's like, uh, changes uh, sleep positions? You have to model this. Um, and to conclude, uh, how do we change healthcare using AI? We want to automate the boring stuff, but when you do, beware that all models are biased. And we have to know and communicate the limits of our models and our algorithms. And we want to use AI-boosted humans for discovery. But to do that, we really need to understand the data, how it's created, how it's processed. And finally, collaboration is key, because you might not know what you don't know. Thank you very much.